We worship you, Father. We glorify you. We magnify your holy name. Here again, saith the Spirit of grace, this message of love. Faith, hope, and charity, which is love. But the greatest of these is love, saith the Spirit of grace. It's not that I want you to not appreciate or go after faith or power, but understand that the love is the solvent that makes all things possible, saith the Spirit of grace. Above all, have charity. Above all, walk in love one towards another, saith the Spirit of grace. For the revival will be birthed out of a great, a great love one for another, saith the Spirit of grace. Give each other room. Do not be small. Do not be small in your thinking. Do not be small in your disposition one towards another. Do not be small in your speech one towards another. Do not take it upon yourself to repeat unnecessary chatter or rhetoric that it goes to no end to the edifying of the brethren. Do not be reporting do not be reporting of things heard through the grapevine. Speak that which is truth. Speak that which is edifying to the body. Let everything that has anything less in it fall off your tree, saith the Spirit of grace. Be a planting, a tree of the Lord who has on its limbs and its leaves and its fruit produces in its season. In all manner of season. Let those who come before you and around you. Eat of the harvest of your tree and the fruit. Let your leaves be for healing. Let your fruit be sweet to the taste. All that you speak and all that you say. And even your disposition around you. When you're quiet, let it emanate life to those around you. Do not be a necessary source to have to be fed, but rather be a source to feeding others the life of God. For I have not, have I not, for have I not, called each of you as ministers of my grace. Though you may not be called to the fivefold, you're each called according to, as I said in the book of Hebrews, each one should be teachers. Teachers of the truth, teachers of the revelation, and teachers of the foundation of truth, saith the Spirit of grace. Know that when you come together, it is your time to minister. No matter who stands in the pulpit or has the baton to speak, each one of you that have grown and are growing in maturity towards the harvest of the nations, come with an understanding that you are to bring forth life in abundance. Life to the stream that creates a river a life to the stream that creates a river to the nations and healings to the people. And he answers a question, for what? What? Answer. Or what business does emotions or feelings have anything to do with what I've called you to do, saith the Spirit of grace. For have I not called you to a higher level of living, to live in the Spirit? 
You can live in the Spirit and exercise my grace in the Spirit way before the emotions come that couple your encouragement and bring forth your encouragement. Act on faith. Live in faith. Work out of the realm of the Spirit. Give no regards. Treat. And I hear him saying this. Very powerful in front of me. Treat emotions contrary to the truth as a snake. As a poisonous snake. If you see them from a distance coming to you, Treat them with no regard. Do not court them. Do not give one moment of pacifying them. Speak that which is truth, saith the Spirit of grace, and you will have your harvest. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Glorify you. Thank you, Jesus. spoken to us and I had no idea that that was coming until he interrupted me in tongues but he seems to have a, a moment of sila so let's do that let's just continue for a few more moments Worship you, Jesus. Would you ascribe to him out of your own priesthood thanksgiving for his life to us? We worship you, Jesus. We bless you and glorify you. We glorify you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Blessings and glory and honor. Thank you, Jesus. <coughs> Hallelujah. Glory. Well, if things happen the way they should, and they very possibly will, then a week from today, next Sunday, we will be live streaming, and that'll be wonderful, won't it? Isn't that a dream that's a, a vision that's come true? Now, we've been doing some live streaming through, and we are again this morning through our Facebook, but that's through a cell phone. That's not our camera, and that's not going through our website. The quality is going to be way better, 100% better, and it'll be just, it'll be great. Hallelujah. So uh, I say this kiddingly, but just to kind of introduce it, I said, you know, a couple weeks ago, come looking your best because you'll be presented to the world next week. But the reality is, is that we will be having like pre-service worship, please, if you're here for that. There'll be music being played. There won't be anybody in front. Um, uh, so we will start at 9.30, okay? And then if, we, if next Sunday's different, if we have to wait, then that's okay. But, and I'm speaking to our, 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 
our man that's, that's performed, doing all this. Um, but please, if you're here for that, please worship the Lord. Um, don't be standing up here in front of everybody talking. Because <laughs> we're going to ask those people to be, if they want to come and worship. And the other thing, too, is just going to be uh, all that anybody ever wants is to be in, in a service. That's it. So we're not performing and we're not trying to, this is not a, a cat, we're not casting anything. We're not trying to perfect anything. Just like there's glitches in a service and just like there's a, there's a you know, it's just life. That's all, that's, we're just inviting um, everyone into, into this sanctuary and they're inviting us into their living room or wherever they're at. And they don't have to be at home. They can just wherever their smart device is at. And there will be a lot of people that are watching. I, uh, Wednesday night I was talking about my brother that I had just met and a uh, really nice guy. His name's Tony. He may be watching this morning. I don't know the, the difference in, in Sydney, Australia's time. But as soon as I got home, he was texting me and he'd been watching the service. And so he was really excited. And uh, a lot of people will be blessed extremely as a result of it. And so... We appreciate the Lord. Aren't we glad? Hallelujah. Amen. I hope we can do better than that. Are we glad? Hallelujah. Maybe it's me. Maybe I was too subdued. I'm still coming out of the spirit here. I want to stay in, but hallelujah. So we appreciate. And uh, so just like moments ago, we're just going to have our service. It doesn't, it's not going to be scripted. We may have some of those soak, soaking services where nobody's doing anything. They're just going to sit there and soak with us if they want to. If they tune in about the time that I'm standing here for 10 minutes and we're not saying anything, they might be saying, is, is this thing on pause or what? <laughs> but we're just going to have service because that's what they want and that's what we want to give them. Hallelujah. And we appreciate it so, so vitally much. Hallelujah. Um, we appreciate all of you. Um, I, I say it often, but I don't say it enough, maybe. I uh, appreciate your sensitivity in giving and especially for those of you that come here on a continual basis you're praying about this with us you're believing God with us I hope that you know every once in a while you know when when we bring forth this portion of the service maybe it brings mo more attention but I hope that your contemplations are as elders as members are thinking about you know what is my part apart from the services and are preparing something in your heart and saying this is where I'm at this is what I can do it's not beyond what I can do but it is what I can do and so we appreciate it so very much and it is a great help so we we just no offering exhortation this morning according to scripture just a thank you and ask you to continue to be very sensitive as the the days ahead are coming I'm gonna ask you to prepare that right now um, and we'll bring it forward in just a moment. I'll give you a few more um, brief announcements. Jim and Kathy Martin will be here the 18th of February. Uh, I tried to schedule that around the Swamp Cabbage Festival because we have families that are here um, that are involved in that during that time. So that's going to, the festival will be the following weekend. So we, we tried to make it in the weekend, which would be more convenient to certain members of our family here at the prayer center so 18th through the 21st and i hope that you're able to be a part of those services that's jim and kathy's always a treat really are and uh, at this point in time gary would love to come down <clears throat> excuse me but he just uh feels uh, very um called to stay and and help and minister uh along with Alan and along with Nathan and uh, whatever whoever else that God has at the prayer center while Pastor Dave uh, is in recovery so we appreciate Gary and he, he wants to come he, he he says this he said it at the conference he said that he is he's got a seat here um, and okay we're gonna make it next to Kirsten okay <laughs> he says that he sits here she just put her arm around Gary isn't that sweet so he says he has listened and been in, uh, in every single service this year so far. Hallelujah. So that's a great honor, and we appreciate Gary being in all of our services. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. 
what else? Tonight we're going to start back with Sunday night uh, confession, and we'll only do that to the Sunday prior to uh, the week of Thanksgiving, and then we will take our usual uh, intermission that will be, I think, the second week in January. We'll look it up, and we'll give that announcement. So we're off. That'll be our season. That's we we will finish up the season of this. Uh, 2017 and confession please um, I can't tell you how important it is I mean it's just majorly important and I pray that people that are living a good ways away and I understand uh, you know not being able to be here if you're from a, another town um, but the neat part will be with uh, the, the web and everything now you can you can do it right on you know right on real time with us That'll be really neat, and we appreciate it. Hallelujah. But we will be in here tonight at 6. We don't have any pre-service worship at uh, the, the, the confession night or calling in the lost. Um, we just worship for 20 minutes, half hour, and then uh, Miss Gay Plamondon comes and leads us for however long that is. 20 minutes or so and then uh, we go right back into if if the, sometimes the Lord has us do a teaching sometimes we've listened to things here recently on the screen um, Gary Carpenter some of his teachings and we'll continue to do some of that in the future but sometimes we just sit and pray and we go up to the hour of eight o'clock and that's it we don't we don't try to go any further so if you can come be a part of that that's so appreciated hallelujah amen that's about all Hallelujah. What's that? Okay, thank you, honey. Um, Candy has on the back table a contact list. It's a sheet back there. Please, um, at your convenience, please stop by there and look at it and see if the information is correct. Is that, is that what you wanted? Okay. So it's pretty easy. It's back there as you start out the door. Sometimes uh, members of our family move and then some people know and they don't then others don't and they're wondering what about so and so and I'll just let you know that our <clears throat> our friend uh, Kevin White that was here with us for approximately three years I couldn't believe how, how fast it went um, has moved back to the state of Texas um, he says he, he will be back but um, he um, has moved <clears throat> the last time that I talked to him he said that uh, that he it looked like that he was going to take a job at a Christian school, and they would be teaching at a Christian school, which would be a good thing for him. So we appreciate, um, and he he periodically gets in touch with me. But uh, if you think of Kevin, remember Kevin. Just say a prayer, bless him, and uh, I believe we'll see him again one day. But he is he's he's not not coming to church. He's just moved away. Hallelujah. So. Everybody knows now. Praise the Lord. All right. Why don't we all stand together and you get ready to bring this down, and we appreciate it so much. And if you miss someone in that first hugathon, you've got just a little bit of time to do the second one. Amen, Marty. Thank you. Appreciate it. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Amen. I want us also, I was just, as we were worshiping there, I just thought of something else that I would like for us to pray about and bring to your attention because it's so applicable to everything else that we've been talking about in recent months about the preparation for the coming of the Lord and for this last day army and some even some things that the Lord was saying last week about how quickly all this is going to really occur. <clears throat> There's a lady that is a part of the prayer center uh, family in Tulsa and is part of our family here. And her name is Ruth Ferris, and many of you have met Ruth. Uh, we call her the lady from Ireland, and uh, she's got a tremendous testimony history behind her of how that she uh, literally just propagated the, 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 the message, Dave's book, and that part of, of Ireland uh, where she lives. And Jim and Kathy actually were over there um, a few months ago and ministered in a number of churches that she had set up for them. Dear Lady Kenny and I have known her for many, many years, and she obviously, as I said, is from Ireland. She has been, had an extended stay at the prayer center in Tulsa, and as of the early part of the week was there. But 
Um, I understand from just texting her and talking back and forth with her a little bit at the beginning of the week that she was flying back um, at the end of this week. Believe it or not, and some of you know this because you may have been following the Weather Channel, that um, there is a hurricane uh, of Category 3 strength was. It is supposed to diminish as it gets closer. A Category 3 hurricane um, that is headed straight towards Ireland. Now, they say, the Weather Channel says this is... Um, so highly unusual because it is the the most easterly storm ever in history does that remind you of something even recently the largest or the strongest atlantic basin storm ever armageddon <laughs> so all i'm saying is basically if you looked at the the geography of things, it would, it would, to put it in our mind frame as far as Ireland is concerned, it'd be like this morning if I was saying, let's pray for the state of Maine, that a hurricane is off the coast of Maine and is going to be hitting Maine. We'd be like, Maine? Florida, yes, but Maine, no. That's the same, same kind of geography kind of as what you'd be looking at, basically. So all I'm saying is this, along with that, is that these are the last days or we're going into them you know I, I i was talking with gary and jim on this as i was bringing it to the recognition uh, or just to their attention rather of us praying for uh ruthie and jim said these are the beginning of sorrows and i believe that if you go if you look at uh, matthew 24 25 um, Jesus said, these are the beginning of sorrows. And I, I certainly believe that we are in uh, that time frame. Are we in the fullness of uh, tribulation? Not as of yet, but we are in that part that you would call if you want to, if, you want, if you're a person that says, well, what phase are we in? We're in the beginning of sorrows. So we're in Bible times. We're in Bible times. And so let's pray for Ireland. Let's pray for Ruthie. In fact, we'll do our directives like we're, we're used to doing. Father, we worship you and glorify you. All things are possible. So exactly what we saw here, we speak there. In the name of Jesus, we command this storm, weaken in the name of Jesus, have no effect over Ruthie's house, Ruthie's property, or anyone else in Jesus' name that is standing and believing in faith for the power of God. We save the angels of the Lord and camp around about them and always deliver them in Jesus' name. That these things will not be, their things will not be destroyed, nor one hair of their head harmed. Life be in the name of Jesus, and we diminish the power over their region or over their part and over their property and over their children in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. <clears throat> Are you excited about living with all of us living with me and your fellow companions in the last days? It's really neat. It really is. It's neat to know that we're in, in Bible times. We can look right here and, and find ourselves there. This morning, I want you uh, <clears throat> to turn with me to Matthew chapter 17. I'm going to roll these up and get a little cooler. Oh, Jesus, we pray for cooler weather in Florida. There was one day this past week, one day, I don't know if you felt it or not. There was one day of a hint of fall. <clears throat> Now we pray, I think it's uh, not this coming week, but the following week it'll be <clears throat> beginning each morning in the 60s. So that's at least a, a, a good change. Low to mid 60s or mid 60s, I think. <clears throat> Hallelujah. This morning uh, we're going to read um, through some of the the chapter here in Matthew chapter 17. And I, I really think I need to tell you in advance um, before we get into it, because most of you that have been around here a while 
we'll begin to recognize um, the prelude to where we may be going, but I will tell you that we're not going to be exactly talking about fasting this morning, uh, although it, it's going to be maybe part of it, but that is not the main objective. Um, usually Matthew 17 is a, a good launching place to, to really encourage ourselves and each other for fasting, and it, it, it's going to definitely be mentioned this morning. But I want us to see even more um, than fasting, and I believe it's all part of the preparation that we need uh, for the harvest. And it's same, more of the same, and even giving us uh, more um, wisdom and direction into the, to the mind of Christ. I, I was... Uh, praying this week, and I think it was Friday, or, yeah, I think it was Friday, the Lord just come on me, and as, as he often does, and I began to write, and I just kept writing and kept writing, and that, that writing lasted for a while, and then, um, and then it was uh, yesterday, or, or Saturday, yeah, it was Saturday as well, some, um, and so I put it, I, I put it in such, it's, it's in such a long um, a lot of times, and you guys know that, especially in series, I'll give, you know, I'll have notes in front of me, and I've used notes more than I ever have in my life to stay on point and get as much across to you as possible. I find if I don't, there's two, there's two things I must do while I'm standing here talking. Even while I'm talking, I've got to be monitoring. I've got to be monitoring you and also listening to him. And sometimes it's, it's pretty neat. You'll see uh, where you're going in front of you, but at the same time, he'll be kind of standing here. He's in me, but along with me and kind of directing me. And so I have to uh, say what I hear more than what I had planned. But many times what I had planned and what I hear is most of the time it's simultaneous or it's, it's, it's parallel each other perfectly. But in this, this is more than just notes. It's more almost like manuscript. And it's, I just entitled it Essay of Faith because it's more of an, S, in an essay form. And uh, we're going to read first together, and you follow along with me, verses 1 through, I think, 21. Um, but then I'm going to read, and then I'm going to comment um, as the Lord has me comment or as I listen. Try not to rabbit trail too much. Um, but as I'm reading this, and because it's it's quite lengthy. It won't take any more time than what we're normally used to, I don't think. But as it's quite lengthy, as I'm reading, um, I'll look up every once in a while to make sure that I don't lose you and to make sure that you're not flying paper airplanes and, uh, or texting or whatever else. <laughs> but there is a, a real wisdom that we need to hear from the Lord as he's, as he's given it to me. But let's look at chapter 17 here. And please, again, uh, one of your greatest, one of your greatest and one of my greatest enemies in learning is to fall into old school on any subject. And so thank God for what we do know, but ask God if not only now, but have ask God or have the disposition that any time that you begin to go into scripture, that your, um, that your haunches, you know, haunches like your weight that it doesn't wait on just on previously learned information because God is always teaching. And if you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John a trillion times, there's a trillion same but even more powerful revelations to be had each time you pass and review. You do yourself a terrible injustice if you go... Uh, if you go... Uh, autopilot, if you ever go autopilot on yourself or the minister saying, okay, that I've heard, that I've heard, when he says something or she says something that I haven't heard, then my attention will catch back up. In your daily meditations, as you read something that you've read a thousand times, ask God to show you, take the, the foundation that what you do know and take it to what you don't know, okay? Because you're never going to get any place and I'm not going to get any place if we go autopilot on what we already know. In other words, I know this. This I can just cruise through. 
And when the Holy Spirit shows me something else, then I'll perk up. I'm, I'm not just talking about now. I'm talking about in your daily meditations. Okay. Every day, there's something new to learn. Hallelujah. Praise God. This is very, very important. This is an adventurous book, people, and a very adventurous book. I hope to God that you fall in love with it. If you can ever fall in love with your Bible, I, I, I'll, I'll guarantee you. If somebody asks about, well, are they going to make it? I, they got a USDA stamp or they got a US God stamp of approval. If you fall in love with your word, you're good. Storms will not take you out. Hallelujah. You'll make it. Hallelujah. If, you, if the word, now this is a good rabbit trail, and I can rabbit trail in here. <laughs> but if the word is not precious to you, I just might as well say it. You're vulnerable. You're vulnerable. Um, important. Amen. Matthew 17, and I think I'll read, and then I'll read the whole thing maybe, and then, uh, and then come, come back to points and start the essay. And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto him Moses and Elias, that's Elijah, talking with him. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee and one for Moses and one for Elias. And while he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were sore afraid. And Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise, be not afraid. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no man, save Jesus only. And as they came down from the mountain... Jesus charged them, saying, Tell the vision to no man until the Son of Man be risen again from the dead. And his disciples asked him, saying, Why then say the scribes that Elias must come first? Jesus answered and said unto them, Elias truly shall first come and restore all things. But I say unto you, that Elias is come already, and they knew him not, but have done unto him whatsoever they listed. Likewise shall also the Son of Man suffer of them. Then the disciples understood that he spake unto them of John the Baptist. And when they were come to the multitude, there came to him a certain man, kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son. For he is a lunatic and sore vexed, for oftentimes he falleth into the fire and often into the water. And I have brought him to thy disciples, and they could not cure him. Then answered Jesus and said, O faithless, and I will put a footnote here, I, I believe that he was quite demonstrative here. O oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you or allow you? That word suffer, of course, means to allow you. Bring him hither to me. And Jesus rebuked the devil, and he departed out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. Then, the, then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, Why could not we cast him out. And Jesus said, Because of your unbelief. For truly I say unto you, or verily I say unto you, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible to you. How be it this kind goeth not out but by prayer, and fasting. 
Okay. That's our reading. Now let's just talk about the moment and talk about what's going on here as a result of the moment. Uh, we find out of the first part of this is that Jesus uh, and three of his 12 disciples go up into a, it says, a high mountain. Um, this is not necessarily spiritual, but it kind of pulls you into the moment. Um, there, most scholars and most people that have ever written on this, there's somewhat of a debate on it, um, but the most understood place is what they call Mount Tabor, T-A-B-O-R. And it is like seven kilometers outside of Nazareth. And so they really feel like that Mount Tabor was the place where that's where Jesus was transfigured. He takes these three disciples up there. Um, how many hours? I don't know. They're up there together. And he is transfigured. He becomes a glowing light. Just absolutely. His clothes, his body, his whole person. What happens in all reality is that Jesus... Uh, now, don't ask me how to explain all this, but this is what happens. He's transfigured. He, he himself steps into the spirit realm, okay? Moses and Elijah, which are no doubt in Abraham's bosom, which is a spiritual, uh, it's, a, it's a cavern. It was a spiritual cavern in the belly of the earth. And spiritual beings were there. Um, they obviously, God, by his spirit, brought them to the surface of the earth. And they're standing there on Mount Tabor with Jesus. And Jesus is inside the spirit realm. And the glow is absolutely the glow of the golden man on the inside. I do not believe you're looking at the glow of Logos, I believe you're looking at what you and I, all of us, if we could actually stand inside the spirit realm and just look at the, the, the spirit man is light and it's righteousness. It's all the things that those guys were, were, were viewing that day and here he's glowing. I don't know if you've ever heard the messages that Gary taught years ago about the golden man. Great, great series. But they're watching this, and they're looking that, at this, and Moses and Elijah are there. And uh, somehow, of course, it, it sounds like by the description of the evidence there is that they immediately knew who they were, although they had obviously never met them. But they are watching this discussion, and of course, Peter, you know, pipes up and how Peter is. So, you know, God bless Peter. He's always shooting off his mouth. And then God scares the... You know, I mean, it just scares Peter to pieces by saying, this is my beloved son. In other words, Peter, <laughs> hush and, and, and listen. So, so we see that uh, immediately Jesus um, ministers to them. They start down the mountain. He tells them, I'm telling you what we've, we just read, but with a little bit of emphasis. Jesus tells them, tell the vision to no man until the Son of Man, myself, is risen from the dead. They had a, a question. They said, why do the scribes say that Elias must first, came, first come? Now, they had just seen Elijah, so I, I can understand why they're asking a question about him. Obviously, they thought um, if there's a prediction of prophecy that he's, he must come first, did what, we just, did what we just encounter, is that part of what the prophecy is? I mean, is, is Elijah coming? As w we just saw Elijah. And so their thoughts were invigorated. You know, their questions were invigorated. They were like, what's going on here? And Jesus said, no, Elijah, for this dispensation, has already come. And they understood, after what he said about that, that that was John the Baptist. And that they have destroyed John the Baptist. They've killed John the Baptist. So he answered their question. And then he's coming into a situation that we've read many, many times before of his disciples, the other nine that are there that were putting on, it must have been a public display 
that was bringing quite attention to, to the moment. And the father of the lunatic boy comes immediately once he sees Jesus coming. So Jesus is hiked down from the mountain. Uh, like I said, about seven kilometers away, and he's, he's walking into this situation. And this man falls at his feet, and he's like, I'm done with these guys. I'm done with them. I've got to come to, to the head man. I've got to come to the, to the source. And so he comes to Jesus, and he falls at the feet of Jesus, and he, he begs his help. Now, this is where I'll begin to read, and... Uh, also listen, and, and if you'll listen. The disciples were amazed in Matthew 17 that they could not do what they had done before in casting out the devil. And I'll pause right there. Luke chapter 19, don't, or 9, you don't, turn, you don't have to turn there, but there um, it says it, it, it is a, another a rendition of this same story. But prior to this happening, he had already sent his disciples out. Prior to this happening, according to Luke 9, he had not yet sent the 70 out. And, you know, the, 70s, the 70 were the ones that came back with the, oh, my gosh, we can't believe it. You know, the, even the de devils are subject to us. But the point here is this. Uh, if you put Luke 9 and Matthew 17 together, the disciples had already been out. They'd already cast out devils. They'd already been doing this. This wasn't new to them. So how, I mean, obviously they knew how to cast out devils because in the, in the time frame of three and a half years or three years, this, this has already been, take, been taking place in their life. They could not do what they had done before in casting out the devil. The task at hand probably seemed no different than any other that they had seen immediately with positive results. They must have been amazed and shocked that the past directives were not working. They no doubt had used the name of Jesus as their contact with authority. They, have may, they may have, I don't have scripture on it, but they may have stared at each other in bewilderment. They may have asked each other, what are, the, what are we missing here? Or what part of... His instructions are we forgetting. They were going through the same formulas, but this time it was not working. Okay? Remember, this is an essay on faith. This is, this is my, my essay from the Spirit on faith. So we're, the subject matter, I'm telling you today, is faith. Keep that in mind. We're going to mention fasting, but the subject matter at the end of the day or where we're headed and what I want you to take home is the necessity of faith and what faith is and, and the employment of it and, and, and us going forward in this harvest. And you remember a few weeks, a couple weeks ago when uh, I think this was even prior to the conference that we spoke and we had that message on um, wrestling on Gibeah, how that they, they went out under the directives of the Lord. Boom. They got, they got beat down to the ground. Second time, when they come back, prayed, God, is this your will? Make sure, go out again. Yes, they come back. That, they, they went out the second time, got beat down. It was a, it was a number of times, but the, the message there was this. Um, there was nothing. Uh, there was nothing evident that God said you're missing it. It was the New Testament what we showed that day in that message, it was a New, New Testament correlation or corresponding with Ephesians chapter 6 is that we wrestle. There's a continual place of wrestling. So as revivalists, I think if there's anything that we have learned and are learning is that we must continue to endure against contradicting evidence. Okay? So... In this life, when these kinds of, like the disciples were facing, when these kinds of bewilderments happen, this is when pastors, clergy, and church people go mental. They mentally try to figure out why there is no results. 
many sermons and books concerning God's sovereignty have been inspired by human experience. Human experience inside of truth can be valuable, but human experience never dictates truth. Truth is sovereign. Truth is sovereign. Truth stands right in the face of human experiences. Truth does not try to consolidate itself in agreement with human experiences. Human experiences must bring themselves or bring itself into agreement with truth. Hallelujah. Okay. I heard something there, and so I'll, I'll, I'll rabbit trail on this. The foundation that we have been giving and the foundation that we are pursuing, and not have arrived but are pursuing, the one that I'm teaching, the one that you hear Homer teaching, the one that is repeated by the men and women and the eldership here, it is a foundation of truth based on our love for the Word of God. It is our study of this Word, our, 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 our giving our minds to it so that our minds are not only that are transformed, and then they are renewed by the acting of this word, the praying in the spirit, all those things coming together, and we'll, we'll say more of that in this essay. As we go forth as a group, this is our foundation. We know the truth, and this is, I'll preface this by saying it's not an arrogant statement, it's just our stance for the truth. We are not, and I say this as the pastor of the church, I'm not concerned about reconciling someone else's experience or belief with what we teach here. I've had people that have come here that, uh, if I mentioned, you'd know, but I'm not, obviously, that have called me privately and said, now this is not the verbatim, but the essence would be, um, this is what I believe, um, and I love everything that you're teaching. I love, you know, all of, you know, I, just, man, I love the worship, I love blah, 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 and I love a lot of all the stuff, but this is where I'm at. Um, I, I will call that pets. People have pets, pet doctrines. And they think that sometimes um, they see something that nobody else sees. And uh, that's their pet. And a lot of times they want to bring their pets. Now, I'm not talking about your little lap dog or your cat. <laughs> they want to bring their pets to church. This is a pet-free zone. And so what I, what they, the, they're basically was like, if, if you can kind of, you know, if you can see it this way, then I'd like to be a part of what you're doing. And I'll, all, I'll, I'll do my best always to be loving and congenial, but I'm not trying to reconcile what I teach here with nobody, with nobody's pet. I'll learn from the word and from elders that are alongside of me saying, wow, did you see this? Oh yeah, that's, that's really cool, that's really wonderful. But as people come, we're not, tr we're not trying to grow a church. We're not trying to consolidate people's beliefs. We're not trying to be emissaries of like, okay, I, I can see it a little bit that way. No, I can't see it at all that way. Not a bit. Well, I was planning on coming here and giving my money and being a part of it. I, you know what? I appreciate it. But we're just dadgum stubborn when it comes to what we believe. Just horse stubborn, mule stubborn about what we believe. And we love you. Well, Pastor, you're not going to get a whole lot of people that way. <laughs> you think I'm afraid of that at this point in time? <laughs> you think that scares me? <laughs> Hallelujah. But you, you remember when the disciples said to him, You've offended the Pharisees. What you just said offended the Pharisees. Like he was supposed to say, oh, wow. Well, you guys go run after him and tell him I didn't really quite mean it that way. <laughs> He's like, 
I don't care. <laughs> Let the blind lead the blind. Both of them are going to fall in the ditch. Hallelujah. Now, I'm not trying to make a bunch of mean people out of your family prayer center. I just want you to know what we know, and we stick with it. Hallelujah. The experiences that the disciples were having contradicted everything that Jesus had taught them and demonstrated. If Jesus had not come down from the mountain that day and demonstrated truth, the disciples would have developed horrible misconceptions. Would they not? Doc, their own conceived doctrine. Jesus yelled out, O oh, faithless and perverse generation, he was speaking to everyone, including his disciples. He wasn't leaving anybody out. He was saying, yeah, everybody, you all are perverse, faithless generation. The disciples came to Jesus later that day for a reasonable explanation to an otherwise confusing quandary. The answer he gave was in total agreement with what he had originally said. Faithlessness due to unbelief was the culprit. Okay? So what I want us to see this morning is this. And I'm not trying to get technical on you. I'm just saying, look, if we're ever going to get this person who's not seated here out of the wheelchair or see their eyes opened or this person who um, has a demonic you know, they're, they're demonically possessed. And uh, if we don't want to have the experience of speaking to them and having that thing just growl back out at us and not come out, that's the worst, that's the most demeaning thing possible. Is to have a spirit-filled, born-again believer speak to something that is so far below them. I mean, they are... Spiritually speaking, scum between our toes. And for them to bark back and then defiantly not come out, that is an insult of the highest kind. Because really, that laying hands on the sick and casting out devils, that's for everybody. That's not a grace line from a, from a Pastor Bronk. That is an everybody kind of thing. And so we're, we're, what we want to do this morning as we continue to look into this is burn the candle at both ends to say, look, we're after faith, but we're also after the eradication of doubt and unbelief. And that's what Jesus first targeted here and what he said. Again, the, the experience that the disciples were having contradicted everything that Jesus had taught them and demonstrated. If Jesus had not come down from the mountain that day and demonstrated truth to the disciples, they would have developed horrible misconceptions. When Jesus yelled out, faithless and perverse generation, he was speaking to everyone, including his disciples. The disciples came to Jesus later that day with a, for a reasonable explanation to an otherwise confusing quandary. The answer he gave was in total agreement with what he had originally said. Faithlessness due to unbelief was the culprit. Jesus as their teacher, and now probably in a more, I'm going to say, calm demeanor, spells out not only the problem, but also the solution. The problem was unbelief, and the solution was prayer and fasting. And I'm not giving your annual dose of prayer and fasting message. That's not I mean, if you get that out of this and you're encouraged to pray and more and fast more, so be it. Praise God. But we're looking at the subject of, uh, of, of, of unbelief, but, but more so exercising faith. Notice that Jesus did not. Now, this is important. OK, I just want you to catch this. Notice that Jesus did not say to his disciples that they had no results because of their walk of righteousness. Did everybody get that? Don't miss that, okay? Because we've been saying it in different ways for a while now. Notice that Jesus did not say to his disciples that they had no results because of their walk of righteousness. That wasn't the problem at the moment. Nor did he say that the miracle was withheld because of their love walk. Is everybody listening? There was no secret formula they were missing. It's not happening. 
There was no secret formula they were missing. There was no curse to break. Hallelujah. Okay. Now, you, you all guys, y'all are listening, and I appreciate that. But you don't give the amens like a group or the astonishment like a group that f- hearing that for the first time. Because, thank God, that is already foundational knowledge to you. You don't know how many churches that you would sit in that would believe that no results is a result of curses. Generational curses. Those are pets. Those are pets. Pet doctrines. There was no inner healing to be had or given as a result. You know what inner healing is? Okay, some of you don't. The inner healing rooms are where somebody takes you in. I've done been through this 15 years ago. I wish you would have been there and hit me in the head with a baseball bat prior to going into <laughs> and then prayed me up. The inner healing rooms are, you're making fun. Yes, I am, for a point. They take you in a room and they, I'm not being vulgar here, but they undress your emotions They take you back and back and back and back. And they, and because they're trying to get to some root, all roots were taken out the day you got born again. He has no more power of sin over you. Now your discussion, if it makes you feel good to say what your daddy did to you as a little boy, I'll hear it one time. But I won't hear it twice. Because what daddy did as a little boy, if he was a womanizer, that don't give you the excuse to be a womanizer. You've been been born again. Now, Now this part I can preach. I like it. Sin shall have no more dominion over you. Well, mama, mama was an emotional wreck all my whole life. You know what? That's pitiful. And I'm sorry for that. But once you got born again, you got a ticket to ride. And if you want to, now that's up to you. If you want to, now if you want to call, if you want pity, if you want a pity party, you can just drown in that all the days of your life and use that as an excuse because mama was a depression. She was a manic depressant all of her days. And if you want that, but if you want free, you can be free. And those inner healing rooms, they take you in there and they, they got a couple people you know, maybe they'll have it for a woman. They'll have a couple. I, I, you know, I've, I know churches. I know churches. They'll go through that whole thing. And they'll, what happened to you? Well, let's cast that out. And let's cast that out. And let's that, Jesus. <laughs> the problem is most of it's flesh. All of it's flesh. And you can't cast flesh out. You got to kill flesh. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Hello. <laughs> Hallelujah. Pets. <laughs> Hallelujah. Pet doctrines and all. Oh, okay. You know what? The bottom part of this was I didn't finish reading it. It says there is no inner there was no inner healings to be had, just it was just plain, dumb, vanilla unbelief. The amazing part of this unbelief is that it was much deeper than surface unbelief. The disciples would have sworn that they were in faith each time they told the devil to leave in Jesus' name. This kind of unbelief is so subtle that it lies buried deep within the undetected resources of the soul. It is undetectable to the public. It is undetectable even to the individual. The only thing that identifies this unbelief is when faith is needed the most. That's when you can really see where it, if it actually exists. That's when it places the greatest pressure against faith, often to the point of nullifying the result of the faith. Hallelujah. Now, I'm not, listen, I am not trying to make us a bunch of scumbags that haven't received revival. I'm, let me get my Bible and sit down here with you. I'm trying to, for all of us to come to a, a God conclusion 
of why the mountain doesn't move. But not to identify just the problem, let's go into a place where we get 100% results all the time. Is that place attainable? I believe it is. I, I thoroughly in my mind, my heart has, but now my mind is, my, my, my heart is convincing. John G. Lake in their best year, in, best year in Spokane, Washington, through, I can't remember the, how many they prayed for, like 100,000, 200,000. The best year that they got in percentage results um, for one year was 76%. In other words, 76% of all, all ailments that came before them, they got healed. That's, in, that's incredible. That's pretty incredible. Somebody said, well, what about the other, you know, 24%? Listen, if you'll give me 76% right now, I'll take it. Hallelujah. But I'll keep fighting for the other 24%. They literally, historically, this is not hearsay, historically shut down a local hospital. It went out of business. It literally did, right there in Spokane, because they drained their customers. They, they took away all their customers. Hallelujah. This is what revival looks like. This is what the kingdom of God looks like. This is what the power that we are commissioned present tense to walk in and will walk in in the days ahead. Hallelujah. Not just Bronx Flint pastor, but every single one of you in your work, in your jobs, come back in here giving us incredible reports of these paddles. Everybody hold up one, at least one of your hands and say, and these are powerful instruments of God. To lay hands on the sick and see them recover. Hallelujah. The argument could be made that these men were yet to be born again. I mean, somebody could say that, but they were working within the con and that they were working within the confines of a fallen nature. But the response that Jesus gave lets us know that the remedy was to the future church. The church would face the same subtle unbelief of the flesh and need the same solution. When Jesus said, this kind cometh not out, but by prayer and fasting, he was identifying the kind of unbelief that was puzzling his disciples. Have you ever been puzzled? I know I have. By not seeing the results. He did not mean that this kind of devil... Or this kind of circumstance, his statement was in context to what he had already pointed to as the problem. The problem was unbelief, and the remedy of this kind of unbelief was prayer and fasting. Jesus was saying this kind of unbelief will not come out of you. It will not come out of you without prayer and fasting. The mystery of faith is that faith, it's okay, it's just church, just family, Hallelujah. The mystery of faith is that faith is the door. Now, this is very important. Listen to this part. Okay. I'll get up right up here in front of your face. Okay. The mystery of faith is that faith is a door. Um, I'll read, read it, Bronk. It's a door. It's a passageway into the miraculous. Faith is the substance that moves the hand of God. Faith is not desire. Okay? That we, we, gotta, we have to conclude that. That's important. The disciples were desiring with all their hearts to help the man and his son. Every Christian that has ever stood beside the bed of a dying fellow Christian truly desires with all their heart to see them raised out of the sickness the person dying <laughs> desires with all their heart to be raised and to serve God, raised up and serve God. So this is, this is like see the ball. You know, this is real elementary. And you're like, duh, maybe. But some people don't, maybe some people don't understand. Desire is not faith. Great desire is not faith. 
It's, faith is an altogether separate entity. It's altogether separate. In other words, you can, and this is, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not mean, I'm not demeaning this. You can cry at the bedside. You say, well, pastor, you, if you'd ever been beside, you know, the somebody, listen, some of the closest people on the planet that I love, Candy and I watched her dad. That was, I mean, he wasn't a father-in-law. He was a dad. I love that man. I mean, Candy and I have been married for 40 years, and he, he got to be like a dad to me. We watched him become a skeleton and die in his bed from cancer. So I know what that feels like. I know what that experience is. I know how heart-wrenching it is. Desire, if you could have bottled up my desire, it was, it was big as, a, as the Empire State Building. His desire to stay with us was as big as the Empire State Building. Desire is not faith. You can wrench your gut, cry like a, like a scalded dog. You can cry and beg. Desire is not faith. Hallelujah. Do you understand that? That's why some people get miffed at God. They get mad at God. Even Christians, they'll get mad. They live half their life because they desired with all their heart to see God do something, and he didn't do it. But desire is not faith. And they get mad at God. Cuss God out. Walk away from him sometimes. Like, you know, I, you know what? I'm going to prove something to you, big fella. You wouldn't come to me in my hour of need, so. But desire is not faith. It's separate. It's separate to have all the desire in the world and never, never receive. Faith is not mental. Okay? It's not a mental affirming. All the memorizing of Scripture in the world and the proper prayer prayed, in other words, doing it just right like you're supposed to, oftentimes will not produce results. Okay? Well, we, we go back to experience that I told you that experience is not, it's not the dictator, but if we just used it in a, in a certain sense of to say this, I know that I'm, humbly speaking, I'm full of the word. I've read through his word. I, 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 I've read the New Testament, the whole New Testament, I don't know how many times. I've read probably all of the Old Testament there may be certain portions of like the Chronicles and the Leviticus that I just kind of skipped over. But I've read that, read that, read that. I, I, I studied all the major prophets and all the minor prophets in school. Okay. But I've had them die on me. <laughs> well, Pastor, you, you're not encouraging me. You're <laughs> no, we are. Because we're going someplace we've never been. Although faith is connected, now listen to this, although faith is connected to virtues like love and righteousness, it still stands alone in its own separate identity. Often the person praying, now this is important, often the person praying the prayer and the person receiving are walking in a life of righteousness with no hidden agendas, yet finding no results. Oftentimes, the one doing the praying and the one praying the prayer are walking in the love of God far more than sufficient to keep back any hindrance from malice, yet finding no results. Faith is a door. It really is. It is its own separate. It's connected to love, and it's connected to righteousness, but it's its own separate entity. Faith is a door. It's a, passway, a passageway to access all that he Christ is and allows him to access or to move in the circumstance. It would be a horrible misconception of our father to see him standing in front of us with all power to heal and give the miracle and yet unwilling to move unless we made concession to a formula that he called faith. Faith is not a formula. It's not a formula. In other words, it's not like Check, I did that. Check, I did that. Check, I did that. Now, 
we know faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things according to Hebrews, not yet seen. But it is something that is built. It is something that Jesus spoke of, and, and as I read the con finish up this essay, we'll, we'll read what Jesus said about it. But it is also, not only is faith exercised that moved the mountain, an entity of itself, there's a corresponding, now I'm telling you what I'm going to tell you, not only is there a faith positive, there is in a certain sense a faith negative, if you want to say it like that, or a corresponding negative part of what you and I have to do or to deal with, and that's eradicating unbelief. And you, 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 to walk in the full measure of this, you've you got to have both because Jesus cited both. Okay, I've heard ministers that would teach on faith, 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 and that would be their thing. And they would teach you all the avenues of faith, and that's, that's wonderful. That's a beautiful, positive side. But there's also the other part here that Jesus said, faith... If the doubt or unbelief that comes against faith is not eradicated, as I said before in that other statement, or as the Holy Spirit said, when you need faith the most, the unbelief will show up and prove itself to be there. Proverbs says that an unfaithful friend, now this is not verbatim, but it says an unfaithful friend is like a broken tooth or a, or a, or a foot out of joint. Now, you can live with both of them, but put pressure on either one, and it'll show up that something's wrong. That's, a, that's strong. Once you put pressure on your faith, if doubt and unbelief has not been eradicated, that's when it'll show up at, its, at, its, at the most vulnerable point. Now, I've, I've seen ministers minister on the one side of it, faith, 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 and not go after the other. The Holy Spirit is trying to consolidate both ends for us. That's why it's important for us to receive every message that the Holy Spirit has uh, Plan for our life. Get rounded out in every place. Let's remember what Pastor Dave used to say. Get in a certain, maybe a New Testament book, read, 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 but go over to the Old Testament, get that too. And he'd say sometimes read through the Old Testament. Why? Because all of us need to be, have the fullness. Have the, the full message of what he wants to get across to us. Hallelujah. Amen. Anybody getting anything out of this? I know I am. Hallelujah. Let me move forward. I'm, as I may have to finish reading some of this next week and go into the other part of it. The horrible, it would be a horrible misconception to think that Jesus would, 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 uh, would withhold in a stubborn manner the miracle that he had paid the price for. He is not stubbornly withholding. The miracles for our own personal healing and the healing of the nations are already within us. Hallelujah. Now, we've been teaching on that. Listen, if you go to minister, if you're waiting for it to come, your, your disposition is already kind of a little out of whack. You need to know that it's already here because it's in you. The healing to heal you is already within you. Do you understand that? That's, that's Romans 8, the law of the spirit of life. That doesn't need to come from someplace else. Now, the healing to get out on the sinner has to come from you as you lay hands on them or speak the word. Go, your servant will be healed. That has to come from your authority. They have no covenant with God, but they can, they can be healed. Hallelujah. Are you glad? Hallelujah. Faith is a virtue. It is a fruit of the Spirit. 
It is an incredible, mysterious access into the miraculous things of God. What is perhaps the greatest mystery of all is that God is not. Now, this is, this is very important. What is perhaps the greatest mystery of all is that God is not in control of who gets what from him. He, he doesn't have control over that. That's pretty heavy. It's just when unbelief has been eradicated and true faith has been exercised that all things are possible. That is why that alone, that God having no control over who gets what, that alone, that truth, that is why Joe Public Christian, who is half backslidden and walking in malice, can... He can lift his hands, look to God, and if he can bypass unbelief and receive in faith, he can have his miracle. While Mary Wallpaper dies in the local hospital full of righteousness and love. And don't tell me that it that it, Again, well, that's your experience. I'm sorry, but I've seen it too much. I know people that I've seen die absolutely full of love, full of righteousness. They wouldn't hurt. You couldn't get them to hurt a, a flea on a dog's back. They wouldn't even apply the application to kill the fleas. And they wouldn't, you couldn't get them to, to tell a dirty joke or look at anything. Tongue talking. There is a core, even in that, which I'm saying there's a corresponding truth in 1 John that says if, if our hearts condemn us not, then we have confidence towards God. Oftentimes the man walking in unrighteousness and unforgiveness will have his faith nullified by a heart that is condemned before God in his request, and therefore it nullifies his faith. Nevertheless, the truth stands clear. Faith has its own separate entity as a fruit and a powerful virtue in God. Hallelujah. Is it important? Yes. There are times when walking in there are times when walking in more righteousness is not going to be the catalyst to your miracle. Now you're already righteous, you understand? You're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, but I'm talking about more more mortification. You can get more mortified and still not get your miracle if you don't eradicate unbelief and walk in faith. There are times when walking in more love is not going to be the catalyst to receiving your miracle. Do you understand that? You couldn't just, I'm not going to say anything. I'm not going to do anything. I'm not. Well, praise God, don't. But that's not going to get your miracle any closer to you. Is anybody getting anything? You understand the truth. The catalyst will boil down to one thing and being removing the subtle kind of unbelief that nullifies the faith that brings the miracle into fruition. Hallelujah. Just a little more. This applies to the one doing the praying and the one receiving the praying. But amazingly enough, it can work on either end without equal support from the other. Hallelujah. Now that's good. In other words, it can work by the one praying or the one receiving. But if you're Praying for me, if I can receive, even though you're not there, I can get mine. Or if, see, this is what part I'm working on. I'm working on the part of no excuse. I'm working on, when I see what Jesus did, he said it, he would oftentimes employ their faith. Now, those are dead people. I mean, dead spiritually. But he'd often employ their faith in saying, do you believe I can do this? And they would say yes. Basically, all they could possibly have was a mental ascension to what, that he could possibly do it. I'm working on the part where all excuses usually lay. Like, well, I prayed for them, but they were walking in sin, and so it didn't, didn't work. I prayed for them. They're not walking in love, so that didn't work. Well, that is almost, in many cases, and there are cases like that where somebody's walk. Jesus said after he'd healed them, go and send no more, lest another thing come on you. 
but he, he never did not heal him first. Do you understand that? But I'm working on the part where little babies are sitting there. And they, they don't have nothing memorized. And it all depends on me. Hallelujah. Don't give us that heavy, oh yeah, you're already, it's too late. <laughs> the remedy in the example in Matthew 17 is praying and fasting. The prayer part of this equation is not the momentary prayer that the disciples were praying. The prayer part of this equation is the prayer in private and generates faith and extinguishes unbelief. This is where prayer mentioned in Jude 20 that builds us up on our most holy faith. The prayer is the one that enlists praying in the Holy Ghost, which is none other than the spiritual prayer language, our spiritual prayer language. So if prayer destroys, if Jesus, by what he says here, if prayer destroys unbelief, then praying in tongues has a dual effect in this regards. How so? It destroys a subtle unbelief, and it also builds up our faith. Do you understand? We're not just saying, go get faith. We're saying also there's a corresponding kill the enzymes or the bacteria or however you want to say it or the poison of unbelief. The other, the other twin to this message is the one that does not, and I said to myself, ha ha on this, it's the one who does not get invited too much to the, oftentimes to the party. <laughs> and you know what that is, it's fasting. It is the power twin that is known about, but it's hoped that it will not be necessary to really make much use of. The power twin is more than... Uh, the power twin is none other than fasting. Fasting, just like prayer, is the most powerful, has the most powerful effect on microscopic uh, unbelief. That is why, okay, so next one. Okay, We're almost there. There's more I'm going to give you next week. Fasting has the innate ability to reach into the flesh far enough to destroy the hindrances that unbelief has on our faith. We must remember that the objective to be obtained is faith. Jesus immediately describes the faith that was, to, was the answer to everything in this life. If we obtain the faith as a grain of a mustard seed, then we could say to the mountain, be removed, and it would obey us. Nothing would be impossible. You could speak to cancer, and it would obey you. Jesus, through the mustard seed illustration, was telling us how faith worked works it begins small and if nurtured to grow it has the potential to develop into a tree that has the ability to produce any miracle from god hallelujah so we'll do more we'll do more next week faith okay and we didn't even get into okay we know that jude 20 says building up our faith but that was not exhaustive that's not the only way you build up your faith we know faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That's another avenue, okay? That's not exhaustive. We know that according to Mark 11, that seeing and speaking the word by confession, that builds our faith. You, you can, you can there's a great, great message of faith, but also there's a message of eradicating doubt because doubt lives in the hidden areas of the soul and it is only identified when you need faith over here the most. I want to develop my faith. Simultaneously, I want to do everything to eradicate my, my doubt so that these two work compatibly together so that when I speak, I have no we often say, we oft, listen, we often say about the time we start speaking that we hear a voice. Sometimes I don't even hear that voice. But the fact of the matter that that doesn't work means that that was speaking and I couldn't even hear it. It was an element there that existed, unbelief. If I can eradicate this, I'll have no hindrance when I need this the most. Do you understand that? So we know all those avenues of building our faith. Here's an avenue, prayer, fasting, okay? That's what he cited there. 
at that particular point. Hallelujah. I said we weren't, this wasn't a message on fasting, but it works. Hallelujah. It works. Well, Pastor, you've, made, you've worked us so hard today. I'm so hungry. I can't wait to get out of here and go eat. Well, bless your darling heart. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's all stand together. Praise God. Father, we worship you. We thank you for your great grace. We thank you for your blessings in this hour. We thank you that we are growing and getting closer to more of what you said that we can and will have. We commit all of everything that you have given us today to the speaking of our hearts and to the power of the Holy Ghost, and we commit your people into you. We bless you and give you all the praise in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. We'll see you, many of you, tonight at 6.